Hello, and welcome to Dark and Stormy Book Club. Regular listeners will know that we are on vacation for three weeks in July. We will be back with regular episodes on July 25th. We usually put old episodes on, but we've decided this year we're going to try reading short stories that have been submitted for our use. I am going to read the story sent in by Ange Papano, one of our favorite people, and his short story is called Sandbar. This story was first published in Stone Cold, Best New England Crime Stories. Enjoy. Sandbar by Ange Papano. She was sitting on top of the crowded bar dressed as a she-devil. When I moved in to get her down, she flung a string of colored beads over my head and reeled me in. Can I tell you something? It was Mardi Gras in July at the Sandbar, my favorite hangout, down on the wharf in Sackham Creek. The bouncer didn't show, and Roy, the owner, pressed me into service the minute we walked in. My date wasn't happy not to get my undivided attention, and lasted all of twenty minutes before she took off. I slipped the beads off and handed them back to Devil Girl. Just tell me you're getting down before you break your neck. She bent closer to whisper into my ear. I killed someone. I thought she was in character. I'm sure, but you still need to get down. She looked at the beads in her hand and let them slip to the floor. I'm serious. I'd say you're drunk. I was. That's why I'm doing these. She held up her Coke and coffee. Mike is a cute name. If I ever get a puppy, I'm going to name him Mike. She pointed at the stupid name tag that Roy had made me put on my jacket. Hi, my name is Mike, she said in a cutesy voice. Do you have a last name that goes with that? St. Martin works. Now get down. Now down you go. Now down you go, Lorna, you mean, and say please. Now down you go, Lorna. With that, she jumped into my arms. It was all I could do to keep us from landing in a heap on the floor. I led her over to a small service table by the bar. You know, Lorna, you don't act like somebody who killed someone, but I did. Then why tell me? Do I look like a priest? She brushed at my tux lapels. Well, yeah. I don't like costumes. James Bond was my least bother. My date has come as pussy galore. My date, damn. Why didn't I tell Roy to find another bouncer? Like I said, why tell me? It's Mardi Gras. What better time for a confession? And since I saw your date leave in a huff, I figured you'd have time to listen. Maybe she was drunk but she was observant. Look, Lorna, I'm not the one you should be telling this to. I heard you were a detective. Another sore subject. I have a one-man agency up in Collinsville. I had gotten into a mess in L.A. that ended up with the mayor going to jail. Now I'm stuck in my hometown until things blow over. I'm not happy about it. Connecticut is way too quiet for me. You killed someone. Is that some kind of figure of speech? No. Last night, the barkeep said someone wanted to buy me and my friend Ellen a drink. She pointed to Roy. I said, sure. I had no money, and Ellen had bought the last round. So I'm thinking, no harm in it. We get the drinks, and before I know it, this guy I knew was at our table. I hadn't seen him in almost three years. The cutesiness had disappeared from her voice. 
I swear, if you did a Google search for an image of Worried, her face would come up. This is the guy you killed? That's right, Blake Harris. After a few drinks, he said we should go for a moonlight cruise on his boat. I didn't want to go, but Ellen was all excited and convinced me. Someone was getting rowdy, and I went over to give him a warning. When I returned, Lorna was on her cell phone. She hung up and dropped the phone onto the table. Maybe it's the detective in me, but I wanted to hear where this story was going. You were saying? It was fun for a while. We were having a good time partying on the deck. Then Blake decides to go for a swim. I'm afraid of the water at night ever since I saw Jaws on TV. Blake was pretending he was going to throw me in. I swear, I didn't push him hard, but he went over. At first we were laughing, but when he didn't come up, Ellen dove in. Lorna started to tear up. I handed her my pocket square. Must have been scary. I was screaming his name, but no Blake. A fisherman in a smaller boat heard the excitement and came over. He helped us to look for a while, but then he said he'd check down current and we should call the cops. A little while later, a police boat came out. They didn't have any better luck. What then? I don't know anything about boats, and neither does Ellen. So the cops towed us in. They questioned us for hours. Ellen was my witness that I didn't intend to push Blake overboard. It was morning before they let us go. I was told to stick around until they finished their investigation. I guess the Coast Guard is looking for his body. I caught Roy listening to us. He moved to the other end of the bar. Accidents happen. It'll be okay. What if they think I murdered Blake? I'll go to jail. Your witness said it was an accident. For besides, you have no motive. She lapsed back into cutesy, making a little pouty face. There's one more thing. Blake and I were married once. What else was she holding back? That slipped your mind? We got married in college. I quit so I could support him until he got his degree and started his law practice. Let me guess, he dumped you for his legal assistant. She looked insulted. No, I helped him all I could. Being a lawyer's wife was boring. I wanted to do something for me. I think I need a drink. I went to the bar and told Roy to give me a rum and coke. Skip the rum and add an umbrella. He handed me the drink and put in his two cents. Don't get involved, man. I've never been one for sage advice. I brought Lorna her drink. You were married to him? So what? She seemed to be trying to find the right words. Well, there may be an insurance policy on him with me as the beneficiary. She paused without waiting for me to react. I didn't. In fact, there is one. It was part of the settlement. It's all I got. My lawyer wasn't as good as Blake. For how much? Two. Two thousand dollars is hardly motive for murder. She looked away. Million. Two million. I considered her two million motives. Still, I gave her the benefit of the doubt. What happened to the fisherman? He never came back. Did you get his name? Blake was missing. I didn't have time to make Facebook friends. Sarcasm became her. Did you notice the name of his boat? I told you. I was crazy nervous. What did it look like? Not big, a little cabin. Wait, I remember a big red rose painted on the back next to the name. It was called Rose Z. You're asking a lot of questions. Something smelled like yesterday's bait. I wanted to know what. 
You piqued my curiosity, that's all. At closing time, I told her I'd call the next day and got her a cab. Roy was stashing glasses behind the bar. He stopped and poured himself a beer. You did good for your first night. Drink? My first and last night. No drink. What do you know about Blake Harris? Roy had a jaw that would chomp a tire iron in half. When he said it as he did then, he looked beyond mean. If Sandbar's walls could talk, they'd take a vow of silence. What about a fishing boat named Rosie? It has a big rose painted on the back. Like I said, yeah, I know the walls don't talk. Right. But I'll tell you this. If I was looking for a fishing boat like that, I'd check out the Pier 77 Marina. The next morning found me back in Sackham Creek. Force of habit made me leave my car up the road at the state boat ramp and walk down to Pier 77. It was a small marina that catered to fishermen in what you would call the low-rent district upriver from the yacht club and the bigger marinas closer to the harbor. The wooden screen door to the office was wide open, but the place was empty. On the wall behind the desk was a picture of a fifty-ish guy standing on a dock. Under the picture, there was a sign, Armand Johnson, owner. I went back outside to see if he was in the boatyard. It was early, and I wasn't surprised that the place was dead except for seagulls, dozens of them screeching and swooping. There were only three docks. Most of the boats had seen better days. I walked along a dock, the birds buzzing me. No rosy. I looked down to see where the birds were concentrating. It seemed someone hadn't cleaned the fillet table on sea dock. I headed over there, waving away the gulls. The last boat was rosy, all right, and stapled to the deck by a fishing spear was a body. Even with puncture wounds made by the gulls, I could see it was Armand Johnson. I spotted a folded tarp on the dock and threw it over him to keep the birds away. Then I pulled out my cell phone to call 911. I shouldn't have been surprised when I didn't get any bars. The Connecticut shoreline is notorious for bad cell service. I'd have to get help the old-fashioned way. I ran up to the office and called 911, saying someone was injured on Sea Dock at Pier 77. Talk about understatement. I noticed Johnson's desk was strewn with bills and receipts. One caught my eye, an overnight transient docking permit from a marina at Port Jeff over on Long Island. Armand Johnson had docked the Rosie there late on the night that Blake Harris had gone missing. What was Johnson doing on Long Island? As I slipped the receipt into my pocket, a guy with a fisherman's tan came into the office. I'm looking for Armand. I guess it suddenly dawned on him that something wasn't right. Hey, what are you doing behind the desk? I didn't get a chance to answer when all hell broke loose as the rescue truck, siren blaring, pulled into the yard, followed by several pickups with blinking volunteer blue lights. The guy rushed to the screen door. What the hell is going on? I didn't answer as I slipped out the back way, happy I had parked my car up the road. As I put distance between me and Pier 77, I realized that the guy in the office would give my description to the cops. I had to find out what was going on and fast. The only other person who knew what happened out there last night was Lorna's friend Ellen. I tried to call Lorna for Ellen's address, but there was no answer. 
I knew it was a long shot, but I called Roy and asked if Ellen used a credit card when she bought a round of drinks. I was surprised that he was cooperative. He had a receipt from a Ellen Murdoch. So much for the vow of silence. An easy search on my smartphone told me Ellen lived in Essex. I was there in half an hour. She glanced at me from inside her front door as I stood on the porch of a Victorian house. I started to explain who I was. I know who you are, Mr. St. Martin. Lorna called me from the sandbar last night. Then I can count on your cooperation. I'm trying to help her. I didn't expect her reaction. Lorna has to learn to help herself. She's a train wreck. A man's voice came from within. Who is it now? Ellen called back that someone was asking for directions. Does this look like an information booth? Tell him to get lost. Ellen shuddered. I have to go. I'll make it quick. You were with Lorna the other night? Listen, she said she needed support because she was going to meet Blake. Then she dragged me along on the boat. Do you know how angry my husband was when I didn't come home that night? I had to tell him she got sick and I stayed over her place to take care of her. That friendship is so over. She started to close the door. Tell me, was it an accident or not? That's what I told the police. But truthfully, how do I know what was in her head? So now she had doubts about whether Harris fell overboard accidentally. Had she recanted her statement to the police? When she closed the door, I had more questions than I had before. Somebody was lying. I thought about it as I drove to Sandbar. What if Harris faked his death so Lorna could collect on the $2 million policy? They used Ellen as a witness that he had gone missing and had Armand Johnson take him over to Long Island. Then Lorna got rid of Johnson and suckered me into finding the body so I'd get blamed. She probably intended to get rid of Ellen next. I tried to let my voice betray my anger, so I called Lorna and told her to meet me at the sandbar. When I got there, Roy was behind bar. He was shaking his head. I took it as his way of saying I should have listened and mind my own business. She's over there, he motioned towards a booth in the back. I stormed over. You set me up. She looked down and began to fiddle with the paper napkin. I don't know what you're talking about. You made me think you needed my help. I can't believe I fell for your drunken act. That was the only part that was an act. I knew that when the police had the details, it would look like I killed Blake for his insurance. She realized she had shredded the napkin and swept the scraps into a small pile. I needed someone to find out for sure if I had caused his death or not. I turned to Roy. He told me you were a fairly good detective and you would be here for Mardi Gras. Don't worry, you'll get paid. Talk about a backhanded compliment. She must have guessed that I was thinking. She started to backpedal. Maybe he said good detective, or even the best. Roy came over to the booth with three beers. I knew you wouldn't take the case, what with you thinking L.A. is the only place for a detective. Maybe he was right. Being exiled to Connecticut did stick in my craw. Well, I think she set me up to look like I killed Armand Johnson to take the heat off of her. She looked shocked. Who's Johnson? He's the fisherman who showed up after Harris went in the drink. I'll ask again, why did you set me up? With that, Roy jumped in and tried to reason with me. Sit down and listen. I'm the one who sent you to Pier 77. You don't think I set you up, did you? I didn't suppose he would, but I didn't give him the satisfaction of telling him. 
I pressed Lorna to come clean. The way I heard it, you came here to meet Harris. She didn't like the implication one bit. Heard from who? Ellen? Did she tell you that Harris wanted to see me to pay back some of what he owed me? I could use the money, so I went to hear what he had to say. Did you know Johnson pulled Harris out of the water? She rubbed the rim of her beer glass with her finger and stared at it like it was some kind of crystal ball that would give her the answer. I wasn't sure if he picked him up, but I suspected that's why I needed you. So you're saying Blake is alive. Do you know where he is? I pulled the docking permit out of my pocket and gave it to her. I know Johnson went to Port Jefferson after he told you to call the police. I think he brought Harris there. I also know Johnson was murdered sometime after he came back. Roy put his beard down so hard it slushed on the table. Murdered? This gets worse and worse. And Lorna had a look of true shock on her face. What do you mean? I found him dead on Pier 77. I reached out for the permit, but Lorna snatched it and pointed to something written on the back. That's Ellen's landline number. She hadn't told me the full truth, so I wasn't sure I believed her or not. I decided to find out. I blocked caller ID before I punched the number into my phone. It was a man's voice. Who is it now? Uh, is this Mr. Nixon? The name of my sixth grade teacher. You got the wrong number. He hung up, but I heard enough of his voice to know that it had been Ellen's husband on the other end of the line. I got up from the booth. I have to check something out. Lorna was up and out of her seat before I realized it. Where are we going? Roy shrugged his shoulders as if to say, don't fight it. I didn't have time to argue to Essex. Ellen didn't see us walking up the driveway as she was getting into her car. I held the door so she couldn't close it. Going to meet Harris? I startled her, but she made quick recovery. Blake is dead. Is he? I think he's waiting for you to join him on Long Island. I think you're crazy. I saw suitcases in the seat and I knew I was right. I think so. Johnson figured out why he brought Harris to Long Island and he decided he wanted a cut of the insurance money. He threatened to tell your husband that you were dumping him for Harris. Now I have the feeling that since you're loading your car so openly, your husband is in no position to squeal. He's dead. Am I right? She let out a shriek, turned on the car, and floored it in reverse. She would have hit me if Lorna hadn't pushed me out of the way. The car careened out of the driveway. The driver of the white pickup coming down the road Never had a chance to apply his brakes. We ran out to the car, but there was no helping Ellen. I noticed a reservation for the Port Jeff Ferry among the spilled contents of her purse on the floor. For the second time that day, I saw police cars and rescue vehicles arrive with blazing sirens. This time, I stuck around. I tipped them off that they should check inside the house. Sure enough, they found Ellen's husband dead at the bottom of the basement steps. Two days later, I was playing solitaire on the card table that, along with my desk, made the only furnishings of my Collinsville office. I was thinking of going across the street to La Salle's to get a grinder when I received a call from Lorna. She asked me to meet her down at the wharf in Second Creek. It took me a good 45 minutes to get down there. I found Lorna leaning on a railing and staring at the boats. 
When she saw me, she ran to give me a hug. They tried to frame me, didn't they? Her guess was as good as mine. Ellen had changed her story to the police. She said she felt intimidated by you when she gave her first statement. She claimed that you told her you pushed Harris overboard to collect his insurance money. I could see the realization on Lorna's face. If I went to jail and the insurance company wouldn't pay on his policy, the only way they could benefit is if they had a second policy with Ellen as the beneficiary, which they did. And with you convicted of murder and fraud, the insurance company would have no choice but to pay up on that second policy. Then they would be free to start new lives under assumed names. Lorna looked out across the water. They say if you have the name, you may as well play the game. If he were right here now, I'd kill him. He better hope that he rots in jail. Don't count on it. Blake didn't kill anyone, and suicide isn't against the law, unless you try to defraud an insurance company. With Ellen dead, there's no way he can cash in on that second insurance policy. As long as he keeps low, it's no foul. She changed the subject. Anyway, as of today, I'm officially cleared by the police, and I'm free to go where I want. I wasn't sure what she was implying. Maybe it was better that I didn't know. Why did we meet down here anyway? I want you to have this. She handed me a check. You more than earned it. I looked at the check, expecting to see a token payment. Instead, it was for more than twice my fee. I can't accept this. You don't have this kind of money. She flashed a smile worthy of a she-devil. If Blake turns up dead, my policy on him is still good. But I'm sure he's alive and right over there on Long Island, I gestured across the sound. You may be sure, but no one's seen him. She wasn't trying for cutesy. I wish she had been. I followed her along the dock, trying to digest what she was telling me. She stopped at a large boat and boarded it. It's Blake's. Technically, it's mine, as I'm the ex-wife and the only next of kin. She cast off the line and pulled away as if she had been born on the water. I thought you didn't know anything about boats, I called to her from the end of the dock. I'm a quick learner. Where are you going? To Port Jeff. What had she said? If you have the name, you may as well play the game. I had no proof, but I was willing to bet that Blake's body was going to wash up on shore sometime soon. She called to me as I watched her head away from the dock. When I collect, I'm getting a puppy, and I'm naming him Mike. The end. I'm not an actress, but I hope I did Angie's story, at least adequately. If you'd like to submit a short story, you do not have to be a published author. It just has to be sort of a mystery. We are looking now for Christmas stories that we will play during our hiatus at the winter holidays. Send your short story, 3,000 words or less, to Dark and Stormy Book Club at gmail.com. Be sure to put in the subject line short story submission so that I don't stick it in the wrong file and we lose it. Next week will be a story read by Tracy Stormy. I hope you turn in and listen to that one. We'll see you on the 25th. Bye.